Well, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I'm here to tell a bit of a story today. Um, well, let's, let's crack on. What am I here to talk about? So, once so one of the things I want to talk about is how so I can be in two places at once. Uh, now, perhaps I can sit right at the back here. I've been working for ThoughtWorks for the last three years. Before While I'm that, sitting down there at the front. Working in a startup for nine years. That's one of the things that people talk about with quantum, quantum entanglement. That person up there might be me, might not be me. I'm going to repeat what that person on the screen has been saying in a moment, so you might get a little bit bored by that, but go ahead and do that. Let's get rid of him. So here I have... I hope, the correct branding for this conference. What am I doing here? Well, quantum computing is something. This is me. I used to be somebody that worked in a startup for several years, and then happily about three years ago, I started working for a company called ThoughtWorks. And the best thing about ThoughtWorks is they encourage us to do things like this that I'm doing today, and um, I've been encouraged to research quantum computing, which is fantastic. This is a marketing slide about ThoughtWorks. We, if you haven't heard of us and you're interested in ThoughtWorks, well, come and talk to me afterwards. We have offices all over the world. We do lots of stuff, and here's some of the books written by people that work for ThoughtWorks. Um, so you hopefully would have heard of those technologies, if not, well. And if, if you would like to, if you're more interested in ThoughtWorks, if you'd like to come and work for ThoughtWorks, please come and talk to me afterwards. And that's enough about what I do in my real life. Krakow. Everybody loves Krakow. I love Krakow. Here's, this is a chap that spoke at the last conference I was at in Krakow. I don't know who the bald chap on the left is. I love the architecture in Krakow. It's one of these cities in Europe which seem to be missed by the war, which is fantastic. There's this castle thing in Krakow. I don't quite know what it is, but it looks amazing. That, uh, that building isn't sort of on its side, but I was when I took the picture. And then it got night time. One thing I noticed about Krakow, there's these amazing horse and cart things. And even though we're in Europe, we're, we're not in the UK. One thing I noticed with these cart things, or let's go back a slide, if you look very closely at there, the driver's on the right. So really, people in Poland do know the right way to drive their vehicles, but perhaps not when they drive cars. And I took that photo for my daughter, and then I had a beer. That was the last time I was in Krakow, and then I loved it so much that I spoke to this person sitting on the friend's sofa with me. That's my wife, and she said she wanted to come to Krakow, and then happily somebody invited me again to a conference, but I didn't get here till about 8 p.m. last night, by which time it was dark. That is that same castle thing that was on the earlier slide, but it was kind of dark by then. There you go, there's Gregorsch. He must be in the room somewhere. Hello, Gregorsch, wherever you are. Uh, and Mikhail. And I only know what I did last night by looking at the photos on my phone. I have no idea where that is. This was kind of how drunk we got. Um, that man, I, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, I know he's in the room somewhere, I can't remember his name. I shook his hand, but then we got slightly drunker, as you can see. And there you go. And this morning, I, I could not believe I found that on the way here, which kind of got me to thinking the way these things were around like that. It sort of got me thinking about entanglement, which is a subject which I will, you know, shamelessly try and segue into. I got here, and this cinema thing was quite empty when I got here. It's not now, I'm happy to say, because I always have this fear about playing to an empty room. Uh, I had to go and get a coffee, and this young lady served me a coffee, and it was great. I've drunk it, though. And then here's me in front of one of my slides. There you go. So let's talk about actual stuff. I've got a countdown there. I've wasted three and a half minutes talking about nothing. Why am I talking about quantum computing? So I'm going to tell you, I guess, a story. There was, I was at a conference in Vienna. It wasn't the conference of Vienna. It was just a conference in Vienna, sadly. 
And I saw a talk on quantum by this chap, Alistair, and he's a very, very nice man, and he gave this really technical talk about quantum computing, and I could see everybody in the room was Googling stuff as he spoke. And it, it went way over my head. And I tried to talk to him afterwards. This is one of his slides, so I apologize. That's not me calling him that. That was, that was his own slide. I tried to talk to Alistair that evening about stuff, and it, he was kind of difficult to talk to, a very, very nice man, and, and he taught me quite a lot while I was talking to him. But my overwhelming thought was, I could kind of explain that stuff a bit more easy than what Alistair did, and that's what I'm trying to do. I just give everybody an understanding of what quantum computing is, what it, what it means, and what it is. So I made this joke, that's not Schrodinger's cat. I guess people in the room have probably heard of Schrodinger's cat. That's uh, my daughter's cat. Clementine. So that's Clementine's cat. And what this cat is doing is it's showing you the, the typical cat emotion. Those of you that own cats will understand that. We'll come back to that later. And here's me making that same joke in uh, Vienna, I think. So how did I get to talking about this? This man on this slide... At the end of the thing in Vienna, he said, can you come and talk in Poland? And I said, yeah, of course. So I, um, he asked me to put my slide, uh, my presentation into the proposal. So I did that. I put two things in. The top one that you can see there is, is this boring thing about microservices, which is what I typically talk about. And the one below is, is, is the thing about quantum computing. And at the time when I made this proposal back in uh, April, I had no idea what quantum computing really was. And the crucial thing about here is that the microservices thing, which I understand, was rejected, and the quantum thing was accepted, which made me feel kind of like that. So I had to go away and learn stuff, which meant that this was typically how my Chrome looked for a long time. I had all these windows open, trying to understand all sorts of stuff. And then happily, I met this man, this is our internal ThoughtWorks thing. This is a man called Duncan, and it turns out that Duncan um, was also doing a load of work on quantum. I'm going to annoy the man with the camera now by making him pan quickly. <laughs> and there's one thing you need to know about Duncan, which is he understands quantum stuff in a way that I just don't. So he helped me massively. We did a lot of research together. We moved on. Here's us at a conference, a Microsoft conference, where they were talking about something that I'll come back to later. That was really interesting. Uh, here's me in France. I went to a conference in France. I spoke to the chap on the left. He's a man that does a lot of research about... I wish I could remember his name, but I can't. I'm sorry. Uh, but if you want to take a photo of that slide, then you'll, you'll find him. There's, there's the conference I was at. He was a fantastic bloke. So what's interesting about quantum computing? Well... In a way that you can't get from digital, what we now call classical computers, nature does quantum. Everything that we see in nature is driven by quantum mechanics in a way that we don't quite understand. Quantum mechanics aggregates up into stuff that we can understand, that we can touch, that we can feel. But actually, at the molecular level, at the lowest level, everything is quantum. So the interesting thing about quantum computers, which I'll come back to later, is that they actually can simulate this stuff in a way that digital computers simply can't. So what does that mean? Well, I had this slide earlier, but it kind of explains how, well, these are three very different animals. One's a mammal, one's a dinosaur, one's a fish. But they actually do the same thing. Why? Uh, oh, hang on a minute. Duncan's telling me I shouldn't talk about that, so... That's because apparently I don't understand it. So let's move on. Let's talk about quantum mechanics. So in order to understand quantum computers, you kind of have to understand what quantum mechanics is on a very basic level. I was really determined not to have to do this, but then it turned out I had to. So here's some things I found out about life. Every country that's ever existed in the world that has the word democratic in its name isn't. Fact. Go back to the German Democratic Republic, for example. Secondly, and I get this in my line of work, if you... Oh, hang on a minute. Wrong slide. Never mind. We'll come back to that in a moment. Oh, 
What am I talking about here? Yeah, so. Yeah, when, when we, people try and explain quantum mechanics to us, and the thing about quantum mechanics is people say, well, it's like this, and it's like this, and it's like this. Well, it kind of isn't. We try and understand things in ways that we can understand, like here's an object that bounces off another object. Quantum mechanics is not like that. So I think you have to just set aside everything you think you know about the world and, and move on. And if you speak English as a first language, then that picture is quite funny, but it probably isn't if you don't. Here's my universal truths. There you go. That's what I was banging on about. Any country with democratic in its name isn't. Move on. This is what I do in the general course of my work. Any company that says that it's agile basically isn't. And finally, anybody that you come across that says they really understand quantum mechanics, well, they kind of don't, I don't think. You have to accept that. Apart from the woman on the earlier slide from Microsoft, she really does. Oh, yeah, that's why Duncan's saying be careful, Bernie, because apparently I shouldn't say that, because Duncan claims he understands it. So what I found out was in order to understand quantum computing and quantum stuff, I really had to try it out, which I'll show you later on in this presentation. I want to talk a little bit about what, it, what a quantum computer there what a quantum computer is, what quantum computing means, and we have to set that in the context of, of classical binary computers. I think most people in this room understand what a bit is. Uh, it basically stores a zero or a one in various ways. Usually, I'm told, in a standard digital computer, it's, it's a different voltage, apparently. And that little picture, which I was amazed when I cut and paste this into slides, but look, it changes color. It's showing a flip-flop, which is effectively a thing that stores a one or a zero. In classical computing, you have these things called logic gates. There's a way of putting together as zeros and ones and, comp and composing them in a way that makes sense. It makes bigger sense. Uh, excuse me. And the thing about a classical computer is that the, the logic gates don't cost anything in, in real terms. That You can put the bits through as many logic gates as you like. They don't lose any fidelity. They just carry on through the system to all intents and purposes. They, it's unlimited the number of operations you can put those bits through. And that's the strength of a, of a classical computer. The, the bits don't lose any fidelity. They don't decay. They, they're just there. And... What that kind of means is, in here, what we've got on the top left, that's a classic OR gate. And the picture is showing you how the current can flow. And it, if either of the gates is closed, it, it switches on. And that's an OR gate. And this picture on the right, which I can't begin to sort of explain the flow, is 32-bit yeah, 32 floating point arithmetic. So what you've got there is three, so what, 12 or 14 logic gates. And when you put them all together, you get floating point arithmetic. And that's kind of all digital computers do. They, they compose these logic gates in a way that makes sense, that makes us able to do all the things we can do with computers. And it's really powerful, as we know. Um, but essentially, it's built on just those, those basic building blocks. Now. Here's the quantum stuff. This is the bit where I start getting confused. If anybody in this room understands quantum, please feel free to interrupt me. What is a qubit? A qubit is kind of the quantum analog of, of a bit. It is, and I'm reading off my own slide, it's a two-state quantum mechanical system. So what we've got there on the, on the bottom right, and I meant to put this link in. I'm really sorry, but if anybody's interested, there's a great presentation that I've got a link to... Um, that explains the mathematics behind this. But essentially, it's representable. A qubit is representable by this thing here, which is called a block sphere. Um, I did go through the maths once. I had a maths degree 20 years ago. Apparently, I still have it. And I kind of understood it. But essentially, what, what that block sphere is telling us is that a qubit, at any given time, it doesn't hold a value. You may hear some people saying um, that... Uh, a qubit can hold two values simultaneously. That's not really quite true. That's a kind of simplistic viewpoint, and that's something that you get from Schrodinger's cat. 
Actually, what the qubit is, and I think this is why the block sphere is such a powerful representation, a qubit represents the probability of you measuring it to give a particular result. So what we're seeing there is in, that, in the block sphere, you can see there's the x plane, the y plane, and the z plane. And at any given point, you can measure the value of this qubit in any one of those three bases. In fact, in any plane you can take, any slice through that block sphere, you can measure it. And it will give you a zero or a one or you know, a true or a false in that plane. We generally measure it in, in the x plane. Don't know why. We just do. Um, and it gives you a zero or a one. And as soon as you measure it, here's the thing. As soon as you measure the value of, of a qubit, it then loses this notion of it having a probability. So it loses all the computational uh, richness that it has, which is... Interesting, and people call that collapsing the state. And as soon as you observe the value, the value is fixed. It can't change. So how do quantum computers work? They have gates in the same way that a classical computer has OR, ZOR, AND, etc. A quantum computer has this composition of gates. And that there on the bottom right, those are the gates that exist in the IBM quantum computer, which I will show you briefly later. Um, X, Y, Z measure the thing. H is the Hadamard gate, which applies a kind of 180 degree transform of the value of the qubit. And that is in the demonstration later. The ones on the bottom line, uh, good luck if you understand them. <laughs> I just about understand them, and, and to explain them is beyond my competence, I'm afraid. But if you're interested, please go ahead, have a look at the IBM Q-sphere. So the really interesting thing, I think, about quantum computers at the moment, the reason why we're not using them is that unlike a classical computer, quantum bits, qubits, they leak their state into what's around them. You have to supercool them uh, so that they don't leak state, which is very expensive. And every time they go through one of those gates, they leak information into the gate, which is what happens. A anything with quantum state leaks its state into things around it. So what that means is, in uh, physical terms, to build a quantum computer is, well, firstly, it's very hard, which we'll come to. But secondly, you're limited by the number of operations that you can do on it. Because every time you go through one of those gates, you lose a bit of information. So in real terms, the quantum computers that exist, and there are real quantum computers, uh, they can only have a certain number of operations before the information is just nothing, before it just becomes a soup of, of standard, standardness. The reason why I'm showing this slide, this is back to this Microsoft. Microsoft believe they have a way to make quantum bits, qubits, retain their information in a much better way. They call it um, Majorana topological qubits, is what they call it. There's something called a Majorana fermion, which is a, uh, a um, subatomic particle discovered in the 1920s by a person called Majorana, oddly enough. And they believe by taking advantage of the properties, the physical properties of this Majorana, topolog uh, Majorana fermion, they can make a qubit that retains information in a, in a much better way. So that's Microsoft's bet. And this chap there, oh, I was looking on my computer, but it's even smaller, so I'll look on there. This slide, yeah, he, he was telling us that the, the Majorana qubits will actually have, I think he said, order of five times better fidelity. I've kind of already talked to this. Um, what does it mean? Yeah. Two really important things to understand about quantum computers. Because of the fact that as soon as you measure the qubit, the state collapses into a single value, that loses the fact that it's a, a three-dimensional vector, a, well, a, yeah, a, a dimension in, in a vector in uh, three-dimensional space. So as soon as you measure it, it loses that property, which kind of means a natural consequence of that is you can't store state. So there is no meaningful storage of quantum information. So a hard disk or any kind of storage, it's just no such concept. And at the moment, 
um, the only way to program a quantum computer is through those gates that we talked about earlier. Um, people in Cambridge in the UK are starting to, there's a company, I went to a presentation a few weeks ago, sadly I don't have any pictures of it, uh, where they're explaining how they're starting to build a compiler for quantum computers, which is really cool. And that will start to abstract these things into concepts that we understand as, pro as programmers. At the moment though, you have to understand what the gates do. And that's, that's an interesting concept. In a, in none of us in this room probably, well, some of us probably do. We don't have to program at the level of logic gates into digital computers. If you want to program a quantum computer, sorry, you do. So what does quantum computing look like now? So here's a little picture. I hope everybody's familiar with Dilbert. Um, the reason why this is here is because this reminds me of when Gregor spoke to me uh, before the conference a few weeks ago. He was saying, you know, how's your presentation coming along. I'm pretending to be Wally there and say, oh God, is that my phone I've just stood on? Didn't want to do that, did I? Uh, yeah, there's my presentation. Can I observe it? Well, no. Hopefully you can now. So, has anybody in this room heard of IBM Q? Looking for hands, one, two people. Well, everybody, anybody that just put their hand up, you probably understand it better than I do. <laughs> I don't know. So, IBM has a thing called Q Experience. It is a real, well, it's a collection of real quantum computers. Uh, what we've got there on the right is it's one of their quantum computers called Tenerife. I don't know why they call it that. Um, at any given time when you go to the IBM Q, you can set up a, an account with it and you can program it. Yeah, it's a bit like the back to the 1960s when you had to book time. You, you submit a program and you wait in the queue and then it will execute for you eventually. Um, and I noticed over the last sort of six months or so that the time taken to wait for my programs to execute has got longer and longer and longer, probably because people keep doing talks like this and then everybody in the room goes and sets up an account afterwards. But it is a real quantum computer. It's a real working thing. And the little representation there of the five qubits, that's quite important because in a quantum computer, unlike in a digital computer, uh, the, the, quant the qubits that are linked are linked for a reason, and that means they can be entangled, they can go through the C0 gate together. Without them being in close proximity, that can't happen. Ooh. IBM Q. So there's the URL to IBM Q. And if you're a Python programmer, which I'm not, um, on that page somewhere, there is a, uh, I think that might even be, yeah, that QIS kit, quiz kit as they call it, that is the, the development kit which is written in Python. And if you go on there, there's lots of demonstrations of quantum computing, which I'm not going to show you because I don't understand Python. Um, and there you can program a real quantum computer. On the other hand, hello, mate. Thank you. Do I have to pose like that? <laughs> if you go to the Microsoft site, uh, Microsoft is obviously a commercial company like uh, IBM is and Google and everybody else. Microsoft has something called Q Sharp, which I will show you shortly, which actually uh, you can program, and it is uh, a very good quantum simulator. And for me, it's the most accessible way to program stuff. So if you go to that page, you can download a load of demos, which I'll show you. And I'm showing this slide because, interestingly, this page on AWS was posted back in 2010, so eight years ago. I haven't found anything on AWS more recent than that which tells me that either Amazon doesn't care about quantum, which I find hard to believe, or it's a secret, <laughs> which I think is probably more likely. I think Amazon is doing something big time. Here's an article from March of this year, so just before I first really started researching quantum computing, and it says that, is it Google? Google 
has a 72 qubit computer. The thing about qubits, I'm, I talked a little bit about qubits earlier. What I didn't say was uh, qubits can be, there's loads and loads of ways of storing this quantum information. It, it, sometimes it's stored on an electron, uh, and I had a slide earlier that I think I skipped over. There's dozens of different ways of storing this quantum information. And the problem is with all of those things is, as I say, they leak information into what's next to them, and they just don't work. They, they decay over time. And what you will see in the press from time to time is articles like this, where Google apparently has the most powerful quantum computer. It's a 72-qubit computer. Actually, that's... Thank you. That's kind of meaningless information because if you tell me it's got 72 qubits, that's fine, but how long do they last for is a, is a more important question. How many times can I put those through a gate? So the 72 qubit piece of information is just kind of half the story. It's like talking about uh, the, the clock speed of a computer without telling me what its hard drive capacity is or without telling me how much uh, first level memory it has, whatever. That's why Duncan says, be careful what you say, Bernie. Right. This uh, is our French friend again. And qui invest dans la quantique? Uh, C'était uh, beaucoup de compagnie. Uh, from 2015, this is the latest information I could find. It is apparently saying that all of the countries in the world combined invested something like $2.5 billion or something in quantum computers in 2015. Actually, I don't believe that because none of this is government spending and certainly none of this is secret spending as I definitely believe that most of the governments in the world are spending an awful lot of money on research in the quantum field for all sorts of reasons. And... There's all sorts of articles like this coming about, how, how quantum computing will change the world. So where is quantum computing now? Well, I mentioned IBM briefly. All of those big players are trying to get something ready in the cloud. It isn't there yet, but it's going to be, I think, in the next few years, something uh, that we'll be able to subscribe to, to use, to solve certain types of problems. What needs to happen for that? Well, you need a way of making qubits stable so that they can retain their information. And in the, Microsoft believes it's got a way to do that. I think they've got lots of patents around this. They told us at the, in the London Quantum Group that that will happen within a few years. If you can get that, you need cryogenic systems, which is really weird, but... You need to super cool these things. They keep telling us that um, the IBM Q computer apparently is cooled to a temperature of 0.03 Kelvin or something. Apparently, it's colder than outer space. Well, wow, I didn't even know that could exist. But you need to do that in order to make your computer work. A really interesting thing is you need a way to drive these computers. And that introduces errors. You need a standard computer like this to tell your quantum computer how to work. But... The problem with that is the standard computer needs heat. The standard computer has currents running through it. So you need a way of, of telling it how to work without disrupting it, without, without leaking that quantum information. That's hard to do. I don't know how that's solved, to be honest. Uh, and a kind of consequence of that is because the, the qubits lose that information, there needs to be some scalable way of, of error correcting. In the same way that we have error correcting on communication satellites and so on, there needs to be a way of quantum error correcting, which no one, no one solved that problem yet. The Microsoft person said this, we need a scalable software stack. I think oh, that doesn't seem a problem to me. I think that's why it's green. Yeah, once you've solved those bigger problems, you get to that problem. Great. Well played. Then you need a full integration with cloud provider. I ripped this slide off Microsoft, and that said full integration with uh, Azure when it was a Microsoft slide, but obviously, who uses Azure? Well, some people do. Once you've got all that stuff, well, then you need a way of programming it. You need algorithms and real-world stuff. That, I think, is slightly harder than it sounds because, as I say, at the moment, all of those abstractions on top of the logic gates in the classical world kind of don't make sense in the quantum world. So I think we need a new way of thinking about things. And, and when I've gone to talks that explain this, um, a lot of it goes over my head, but some of it doesn't. But really, it's 
a really new way of thinking about things. So even though it sounds like a software problem, it sounds easy to solve because it's just a software problem, it kind of isn't as simple as we'd like it to be. So I am now going to talk about Clementine's cat. So who's Clementine? Why am I talking about her cat? Well, let's have a look. That's Clementine. That's my daughter. That's a terrible picture of her, but it's the only one I've got that included the cat. The cat runs our house. I don't know if anybody in this room has a cat, they'll understand this, but the cat owns the house. It's not our house. So here's back to Clementine's cat. This is a picture of her looking exactly like cats look. And the first thing I did when I started researching quantum computing was I wanted to see if uh, earlier on we talked about how qubits can store several pieces of information at the same time, which kind of isn't what they do, but it kind of is. So I wanted to see if the cat could have several different moods at the same time. So I applied one of the transforms that I'll talk about in a moment to the cat, and it turns out that, hey, it can have different moods at the same time. There you go. Yeah, you have to speak English to understand that probably. So I'm going to do some quantum code now. So uh, I can't remember what the next slide is. Do I care about the next slide? Ah, yes, we'll come back to that. So. Uh, this is the bit where everything goes a bit weird. Here we have, uh, oh no, oh God, this always happens. How do I share the screen? Do I go like, hang on, excuse me, I'm trying to, this always happens. Uh, I'll go like that, don't I? Just talk amongst yourselves while I remember how a Mac works. Excuse me, I need to go to... Do, do, do. Displays. And I need to go to Arrangement and Mirror Displays. Thank you. So, is that text big enough? It looks big enough. Um, earlier on... Uh, I showed you this web page, I think. Let's see. Oh, look at that. I've been locked out of the wireless or something. Who knew, eh? Good job we do this stuff in advance. So I won't go to that web page. But if you care to go to the Microsoft page that I showed you earlier and download what's on there, you'll find that there is a load of samples. How visible is that? So there are, what, three, seven, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's about 20 samples on the Microsoft website. What they are are programs written in the Q Sharp language and C Sharp. I guess people in this room are probably familiar with C Sharp. Um, it's a bit like Java. If you close your eyes slightly, it looks exactly the same as Java. You can pretend it's Java if you like Java. And what it is is essentially, let's have a look. Oh, no, I've gone and done that. Didn't mean to do that. Back there, please. Oh, no. Excuse me. Oh, no. Why is my mouse pointer going over there? Display. <laughs> ah, sorry. No, oh, for God's sake. If only I knew how computers worked, eh? Let's done it again. Other windows, mirror displays. Thank you. I hope we're seeing excellent. So what we're seeing here is something that I don't want to show you just yet. 
So we're in the samples folder here. I am going to go into one called measurement. Right. Right in quantum code, there it is. So, what do we have? We have two things in here. Here we go. Is that visible? Sort of. I'm not going to bore you with all that text. This is one of Microsoft's demos. What we're seeing here is a Q Sharp program. Q Sharp is a language they developed specifically to program against quantum computers. And as I say, it's all it allows you to do is manipulate the qubits directly. So you have to have an understanding of what the qubits are and what the gates mean. So on that slide ages ago, I showed you the, the basic gates. I'm going to talk you through this program very quickly. What happens is here it basically makes an array of qubits, in this case just one qubit. Uh, and then here what the capital H is, that applies the Hadamard transform to that qubit. When qubits are created in Q sharp, they exist, they have a value of zero in the X plane. And if the qubit, the little arrow in the block sphere, if it's pointing directly in one of those planes, it will always measure to that value. And that's the only time you deterministically know what the qubit's value is. You, you can know that in advance. So every time when you create a new qubit using the Q-sharp language, it will have the value zero in the x-plane. And every time, with 100% probability, it will have that value. At all other times, it will have a probabilistic value. So sometimes you measure it, it might be zero. Some other times you measure it, it might be one. And that is, is what happens as a quantum computer goes through its computations. All of the qubits work together. They go through these gates. They go through these transforms. And what they do is they're not changing the value. They're changing where that arrow points to on the block sphere, which means that they're changing the probability of the value being either zero or one when it's measured. Doesn't mean it's changing the value. And that's very important to understand. So when you program against them, what's happening here? is that that line of code there that I've highlighted, that's applying the Hadamard transform to a qubit. I was told by an electronics engineer that the Hadamard is a person that um, did a load of work in flow of um, electric current in the 1930s. And uh, Hadamard transform is named after that chap. I don't, didn't have time to uh, read about it. But essentially what the Hadamard transform does is it rotates the arrow in the block sphere through 180 degrees in a given dimension, generally the x dimension, I believe. So what it does is, instead of it having a deterministic value of 0 or 1, it then makes it have either 0 50% of the time or 1 50% of the time, but only when you measure the qubit. So what's happening in this program is this very simple one says measurement of 1 qubit. It's, it applies the Hadamard transform, and then it measures it in the x basis. So what this is demonstrating is about 50% of the time when you measure the value of that qubit, it will give you a 0, and about 50% of the time it will give you a 1. It's a very simple program. And if you come down the rest of this demo here, you'll find here we've got two qubits. This line of code, you can probably guess what it does. It applies the Hadamard transform to both of those qubits, and then it simply measures them afterwards. Further down here, it does something similar with three qubits. It says three, but it looks like it's doing it to four. That could be because I modified this program. Yeah. <laughs> could be because I experimented with it when I was last in Poland. So essentially, it's doing the same thing. It's, it's got four qubits and it's measuring their value after applying the Hadamard transform. Now, and that last one's doing something similar. The thing about Q Sharp is you cannot execute a quantum program on a digital computer. So, what does that mean? Well, Microsoft helpfully 
has provided us with a way of, of sort of doing that. So alongside those Q Sharp programs, what we have is this. This is probably more recognizable to the people in the room. This is a C Sharp program. In order to run your quantum code, you need a driver program. You need a C Sharp program to run it. Now, the idea at the moment, you cannot execute these programs on a real quantum computer. Well, you probably can in Microsoft, but I don't work for Microsoft. So I don't have access to it. The idea is that your C Sharp program, it references the Q Sharp program, and it tells it to execute. And the way it does that, this line of code here, this creates a, a simulated a, a simulation of a quantum computer. So Microsoft have built inside of the, the .NET runtime, there is a, a quantum simulator. So what that is, is it's a digital computer, obviously, because it's running on my Mac. And it simulates the fact that these qubits hold a probability. It's, it does it very inefficiently, but it does it. So the idea with these Q-sharp programs is we can write these Q-sharp programs, we can test our quantum algorithms, and then one day, hopefully, this line of code here that says new quantum simulator, when there is a cloud, a real cloud proposition that I can use, this line of code will be replaced by you know, a new instance of that thing that Microsoft has or that thing that somebody has in the cloud there. And then this line of code further down here, this line of code says, run that quantum program using that simulator and tell me what the result is. So the idea is one day, instead of passing this, the simulator of the quantum computer, I'll be able to pass it a real quantum computer and run the real program. Well, it's a real program, but I'll be able to run it on a quantum computer. Because right now, I'm going to show you very quickly, but the, um, oh dear, what's going on there? I want the terminal. The, the program is going to run on a digital computer, which is obviously a simulator of a quantum computer, which is not that efficient. Because digital computers, as we know, can only hold bits. Quantum computer holds this, this vector of information. So what happens if we run the program that we just saw? It's not that interesting, I'm afraid. But I'm going to run it nonetheless. Here we go. It will tell us. First of all, this line, it ran that first one which applied the Hadamard transform to a simple qubit. And it's telling us that 53% of the time it gave us a zero. So as I say, about half the time it will give you a zero, about half the time it will give you a one. I think this simulator runs it something like 100 times. So 53 times it gave us zero. Here's the second program, which is running on an array of two qubits. And as you can see, it gives you one zero, one zero, 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 one, one, one. And that's the thing about quantum computers. All they can give you is the measurement at the end of the program. This is what the qubits were storing. So it can go through all sorts of computations, and then it gives you a result. And it's up to you to interpret what those results mean. So in this case, we've got this array. So when you, I believe the idea is, if you're doing something like a traffic simulation or some kind of strong simulation, you'll run it a million times and then see what the most likely result is. That seems to be the use case for quantum computers at the moment. Uh, next, what are we looking at here? Yeah, so that, I didn't really talk about this earlier, but quantum entanglement, those of you that understand quantum mechanics, you can entangle two things. And it's really bizarre, but you have to just trust it, that when things are entangled, that means if the state of this changes, the state of this changes. They can behave sort of independently, but if you measure the state here, this state here will be the same. So what this program is demonstrating is that after they've been entangled, they're independently measured, and as you can see, both of the qubits have the same value. How that works? Literally, God only knows. <laughs> and then... There's the final program, which has those four qubits in it. Again, that's just showing probabilistically that you, you sometimes get certain values, sometimes get other values. What I will now show you is a program I wrote myself just to prove that I can still program computers. What we have is Clementine's cat. And if I can remember how, there you go. I'll talk you through Clementine's cat. Can everybody sort of read that? Uh, 
I'm hoping you can. Right, here's my quantum program. So, what I'm modeling is our cat. I showed you a photo of our cat earlier. Uh, I'm modeling a cat's behavior here. So, what I've got there is a set of qubits. Um, it's, there's four qubits, and each of those four qubits represent the four humans that our cat owns. So the first human that it owns is me. The second human that it owns is my wife. The third human it owns is my daughter Clementine. And the fourth human it owns is my daughter Felicity. So what I'm modeling here is our cat's behavior when it asks for food. So first of all, I'm applying the Hadamard transform to each of the qubits, to each of the humans. And what, what I'm modeling there is I'm saying there's a 50% chance or so that if the cat asks any of the humans for food, that the human will give it food. Actually, the cat doesn't ask for food. The cat demands food. <laughs> so what our cat does, and I'm sure if people in the room have a cat, they'll, they'll relate to this. Uh, it asks me for food. If I give it food, she, I should say she, shouldn't I? Otherwise, my daughter will kill me. If I give her food, she eats the food. She's kind of happy for a moment, and then she instantly forgets that I gave her food. So she will then go and ask my wife for food and just behave like she's never had any food in her life. So my, there's a 50% chance my wife will give her food. And then she moves on to Clementine, and then she moves on to Felicity. So this very simple program is modeling that behavior. And all it does is it outputs whether or not each of the humans fed the cat. And then if we look in the C-sharp program, this C-sharp program models runs that quantum program. So what's happening is it runs the program, it creates these, it passes it four things which become qubits, it gets the result out. So as you can see, the program is called Measure Cat Mood, and I'm running it on the quantum simulator because there is no real quantum computers. And then I've got this really ugly piece of code down here because... Uh, it's so long since I wrote C-sharp code, I couldn't find a more elegant way to do it, which is essentially just counting the number of humans that fed the cat. And then down here, the final line of C-sharp code says, if at least two humans fed me, I'm happy. And it'll output the happy result. If fewer than two humans fed me, she's not happy. So let's see what happens. I'm going to execute this program. Oh. First of all, I have to build it. Oh, here's the thing to learn. If you start programming in Q-sharp, I don't know about the Python interface, but if you have a build error, it's impossible to debug. <laughs> and well, firstly, it's literally impossible to debug because of the fact that when you examine the value of the qubits, it collapses, therefore they lose the state. So it's literally impossible to debug. But the error messages you get from build errors in the Q-sharp kit at the moment are pretty difficult to understand, and I kind of speak English. so I'm going to run this program, and let's see whether the cat is happy or not. We are going to run this program 100 times. So it's going to run the quantum simulator 100 times and then see what the cat's mood was. So let's see what happens. If the cat's ha so what we we'll probably see is sometimes the cat's happy, sometimes the cat's not just to demonstrate quantum uncertainty. There it goes, and we can see the outcomes. There you go. So sometimes it's happy, and sometimes it's not. And that's Clementine's cat. So if you want to program QSharp, please go ahead. It's really good fun. I have written more complex programs, but sadly, I don't have time to show them. Uh, I'm hoping this goes back to my presentation now in the time I've got left. So, very quickly, what is the future of quantum computing? We cannot simulate molecules. Caffeine, I'm told, is the most complex molecule. There's a representation of caffeine that can be modeled in a digital computer. That is a molecule that is involved in fixing nitrogen. Because we can't model them in digital world, what we're now starting to do is model molecules in quantum computers. The Harbour-Bosch process is, if anybody uh, knows about that, it's used to make fertilizer from nitrogen, from atmospheric nitrogen. 
I'm told that at the moment, estimates vary between 3 and 5% of the entire world's supply of natural gas go into making um, ammonia for fertilizer. And that is because something in uh, beans, I think we all remember crop rotation from when we were at school, something in the bean molecule, which is there, that thing there, that fixes atmospheric nitrogen in a way that doesn't use all that energy. We do not understand that. The only way that we're now starting to understand it is by modeling those molecules using quantum computers. And we can do that because quantum computers behave the same as molecules. So the future of it is, is that modeling hugely complex things, modeling molecules. I'm getting the times up thing here. Very quickly, everybody's worried about encryption. Will my encryption algorithms become worthless when quantum computers are everywhere? Well, yes, they may be, but actually Microsoft, Google, I've spoken to people at Microsoft, I've spoken to people at Google, they are already working on quantum algorithms, what we're calling post-quantum uh, post quantum cryptography, and there, there's a link to post-quantum crypt, uh, easy for me to say, hey? So yes, the current algorithms might be worthless, but it's going to be so expensive to use quantum computers that I can't believe anybody would do it. And finally, when will there be quantum computers that are usable? Well, some people say in 10 years. The people at Microsoft told me they expect it to be sooner than that. Some people believe it will be a bit longer. And if you read, there's the pessimistic view. And there is an Israeli mathematician who believes he has a proof of why quantum computers will never work. I personally don't believe that. But there you go. And Duncan tells me. I'll let Duncan have the last word. And uh, I'm sorry I ran over time, but thank you all very much for listening. <laughs>